All right, so as I said before, um, I'm Greg Bonessi. I'm the lead data, data scientist here at Link. Been dealing with CCAN for about, say, about 11 months now. And when I came in to this job, I knew nothing about CCAN. And so I guess today uh, I'll give a little bit of just kind of a memoir of my experience with the platform. And the point of which I would say is to kind of point out some of the strengths, the weaknesses, where I hope CCAN will go in the future. Um, and in the hopes of kind of giving more of a, a back-end systems perspective uh, to complement the kind of governance talks we've been having. So that if any of you try to engage in CCAN, you might come across some of these issues and know that you're not alone or you're not alone in your wish list or whatever. And so maybe contact us, me, and can have a discussion. So um, I would say first and foremost, uh, CCAN has obviously lost strengths. If it was, CCAN was really bad. It would not have the uptake it does. Um, so it has established um, growing open source community, which is really nice. Uh, I think the thing that a lot of people agree that CCAN does the best is being a catalog for metadata. And I, I would agree with that. Um, and kind of going along with that is it has a very mature API for querying that catalog that seems to work pretty well. And it's gone through a few iterations and it's, it allows a lot of things to be done with CCAN so we can write Python scripts, Java scripts, anything. A lot of things to interface with the catalog system, not only through user interface, but through a machine interface. <clears throat> um, there's also been a very strong core of features being developed over several iterations, I would say. Um, and some, some of the features are excellent. Some of them still require some work. But overall, it's, it seems to be a fairly feature-rich product. Um, there's also good momentum and there's good uptake. So it seems like a lot of things are on the upswing with CCAN. It's, uh, awareness is growing. Uh, people are getting more interested in it, getting more data portals. It's a good thing. Uh, one of the things I, I particularly like about CCAN is that it's, it's actually very customizable. So we can add in functionality through extensions and plugins. Um, that even uh, includes things like putting in custom schemes. Uh, there's ways to augment search results, um, and you can obviously edit templates to get skinning and everything to looking the way you want. So these things I think are all good. And documentation in particular has been, a, I would say it was a weak point even a year ago, but it's gotten a lot better over the last few months. So a lot of good things. That all being said, there's what I would say are some things that need improvement. Um, and in particular, like I come from most recently kind of a system architecture background. So uh, last, last thing I was doing was developing kind of um, enterprise uh, data management platforms. And there are certain things that you kind of have to aim for in, a, in developing that type of code. And while CCAN can do what it needs to do right now, the future I see is inclusive of not just you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, but hundreds of thousands of data sets, possibly millions. And to go to that scale, to go to that scale, some things I think are going to change with CCAN. So there are some issues with scalability, robustness, um, and supportability. So when you go into that scale, it has to be manageable. Um, uh, some of the specific things uh, right now, uh, a lot of things that happen with CCAN, if you click on some part of the interface, the, the interface gets lost or get locked up. A lot of things aren't pat passed back to an asynchronous batch queue, and the things that are aren't always managed as well. That facility needs to be developed a little bit more, in my mind. Uh, but beyond that, there's currently CCAN sits on top of Postgres and Solar. Solar is basically a search index for those who don't know. It sits on top of the database. Now, I'm personally a huge fan of Postgres, um, but and 
I I am reluctant to say, well, you know, big data and you know, we should all go to NoSQL and stuff because a lot of times people do that. It's tantamount to killing ants with field artillery. So for a lot of things with CCAN, like currently even like um, that got a U, the size and amount of data sets, it's still handled well enough by a relational database if you can optimize the schema. The problem with open data portals is it's very hard to come up with a completely optimized schema to do all your queries. So even now, things on like the size of data go that you, if we try to do anything like find aggregate statistics on the CCAN site, the way that's traditionally been done is through an uncached process and that can actually lock up the entire database for even something the size of data go that you. So we've implemented things like caching to cache those results on a daily basis so that the site is stable under that. But right now, CCAN has a number of hooks where people can directly query the database and those, those queries can be extremely complex. So very large inner joins happening and you can actually lock up the entire system. So there is the idea that we have to start thinking about how to get away from relational databases and how to actually make the system more agnostic with regard to the uh, underlying data store, not only for the metadata, but also when people upload resources that's held on a local file store, so in our case, it's an AWS EC2 instance, but we CCAN needs to be a little bit more flexible in terms of just getting data from S3 buckets, things like that, or disparate uh, data stores. <laughs> And a lot of progress is being made in that end, but like the core CCAN right now is still based mostly on Postgres. Well, it is based on Postgres, and it's based on the file store on the OS. It's also intrinsically tied to solar. So again, the system I think needs to become a little bit more agnostic to use things like Elasticsearch, or AWS Elasticsearch, and possibly even more powerful search engines that might emerge, things like Watson or whatever. Uh, now, people who know me know that I have a particular fondness for the data store and the harvesters associated with CCAN. I'm being extremely facetious when I say that, but these two particular modules, um, they, they can be very problematic, and I see them being very hard to support on any site that's getting larger than, you know, I'd say 10 or 20,000 data sets, because the data store, while it's a great idea to be able to ingest um, data into a database. CCAN enables you to directly query that data, which can be fantastic, but if you uploaded something that's several million records sitting on the database and you start querying it, it starts slowing down the entire database. And currently there is no, there is no real indexing or buffering that happens between those queries and the UI. So it's, it's actually a vector for DBUS. Um, the harvesters also uh, have a problem with consistency. So like CCAN is based on this idea of open data, which is great and all, but a lot of things are designed not to be, a lot of the design patterns are such that things aren't meant to ever be deleted. And that's, I, philosophically, that's great for open data, but the reality is people still delete things, and that's causing a lot of problems with that federation and things, and actually is translated into some issues with the harvesters. Um, harvesters work okay a lot of the time, but there's also a limitation of how long they take. So, like you harvest about 10 or 20,000 data sets, expect that to take a day, day and a half. Um, so, if we start going to like the European data portal, you want to harvest that, that'll take over a month. And there's any number of things that can break that process. So, I think we have to start getting away from those paradigms and thinking about in terms of harvesting data and duplicating data. Um, and there are a lot of things, well, there, there are a few features with, with CCAN that can lead to um, one of my pet peeves about data source obfuscation and the history, history of the data source. So CCAN is really good and then it shows you the activity stream for a particular data set, but if something is harvested in, you don't necessarily get a record of where it comes from or where it was, how it was manipulated beforehand. And I would, one of the things I would actually like to see in the future is a historical, complete historical log for the data set. Um, so just 
without going into too much technical details, like kind of compiled a wish list of what I will kind of be pushing CCAN to hopefully develop along the oncoming years um, is I think CCAN should be really focused on what it does very well is being a metadata catalog. Um, and I think that it's that facility in itself is invaluable. So, you know, being really good at that, focusing really good on focusing on that, I think, is a, a good step forward. As opposed to right now, we have a lot of spread out features that not all of them seem to fit within pushing that one unifying idea forward. Um, now, the, the second point probably should have cleared, cleared it a little bit. Like the API for querying the CCAN catalog, I think, is great. And that that is, I think, maintainable and scalable, but there are certain like APIs like for the data store that I think we need to start thinking about how to break those out into separate microservices. And the reality is, you know, if we want companies or, or entities to start using open data or using these APIs, we have to figure out some way to provide some type of minimal SLA on those uh, APIs. And since data sets are extremely varied, even you know, not something like that ago, hey, you providing a, well, you can query it this many times, you can query as much as you want, we can't do that. So if somebody's trying to query a data set to several million rows and they're doing it a few times a second, they'll bring down the site. So we have to figure out how to start breaking these things off into what Stephen likes to call microservices and then designing what I think implementation strategies for those services, how they're applied to certain data sets, and how you scale those out, and what people can expect for using them. Um, I said the more flexibility you give through the UI and the API, the, the more you have to put into support, the more money you have to put into the infrastructure to provide a consistent outcome to the end user. Um, as I mentioned, I would like to see CCAN actually evolve to be data store agnostic. Right now, there's, you know, you have uh, something called SQL Alchemy that basically interfaces with Postgres database, but I really think there needs to be a data abstraction layer of some sort. Now, that might happen in, through a third-party product like Fetch Drill or something like that, or it might have to be implemented in code, but being beholden solely to a Postgres database, I think, will have to change, um, as, especially as the number of data sets and the number of portals and the actual number, uh, the size of the individual data sets starts changing and growing. Um, that's, that to me is the more typical pattern for a data management platform is that it be somewhat data store agnostic and so I'd like to see CCAN actually go to that end. Um, I would actually, what, one of the other things is that I think Right now, a lot of patterns in CCAN focus around moving data. So like harvesters are go to another site, bring in data and import it. And one of the issues is that's okay up to a certain size, but once you start getting to really big data sets, and as I mentioned before, harvesters, even on a moderate size site, can take over a day, you really have to start getting into the mode of not moving data, letting data sit where it is, but linking to it. And that happens through data interfaces. Um, there could be explicit URL links, but the actual linking can happen through the back end. And that kind of ties into CCAN being involved to being data agnostic or data store agnostic. And every time data is duplicated, it leads to my concern about that is it obfuscates who is the who is the actual source of truth for that data. So and how how up to date is that data? So if it's duplicated on one site, the question becomes: Well, is that the most up to date data set I can access, and where did it come from? And that usually is held in the metadata. But if that's harvested from you know two points removed, and it's gone through several transformations in schema, that data can be easily lost. So again, this is kind of an argument for why I think instead of harvesting data, instead of duplicating data, we should be moving to more of a search federation where if I search on data.gov.au, 
the search should be augmented with results from another site, which we've actually implemented on a number of data portals already, that we don't actually ingest data, we just search another site, or um, we have a bunch of data portals in the search federation, we send out API calls that replicate the search on their data portals, and they report back those to DataGov AU and augment the search results, and it actually seems to work quite well. Um, and the other thing, the last big thing I would actually like to see is actually going a step beyond the activity stream for a data set and actually keeping a full historical log of data, saying where it came from, what transformations have happened on it, along with the identifiers for the code set or the people had, that have done those transformations. And I think this is actually a good case for, a good use case for link data. So you can have URIs associated with data sets, snapshots in time, and then uh, URIs associated with people, codes, and you can make a, a historical list of saying where the data sets come from, how it's been processed, all that. And I think that could be invaluable as well, because then data starts getting handled by code in the GitHub repo, and that you can go through the historical log, through the commits, the changes, and everything, see where it's branched off, um, and see, and possibly even see all the children of that data set, seeing how people are using it through the search federation. So, and I think at CCAN's in a very unique position to kind of champion that sort of effort. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's that it, it will give information on how it's being used, who it's using, or what data sets are coming from it. And I see it as a very um, powerful moment to the CCAN um, metadata scheme. So I'd like to see, it said we already have that little bit, but I'd like to see it become a more integral part of the actual um, overall schema. And we, just to, because I know I'm on time, but uh, just to briefly go over some of the things we've done. Um, so recently I've been working on an update of the spatial gesture and zip extractor for data.gov AU. So that currently exists in one form on data.gov AU, but what basically with this does, people can put it in a zip file and elect to have all resources extracted from it in the sense of any file, CSVs, anything you deem interesting can be extracted out with their own resources with the same package uh, or within the same package. And spatial ingester can take any, any type of juice, well, any type of like KML, shape file and expand those out and ingest them into a backend Postgres database that empowers a Geo server that's also hosted in, in um, data.gov AU and that provides an API endpoint for the geospatial resource and that happens for working that happens as a daily batch process as a zip extractor and the spatial ingester but now that's being updated to happen on the fly in an asynchronous manner and then um, Stephen's already mentioned that we've done a GitHub repo um, viewing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let's. So we're moving ahead, and you know, now that I've kind of got my feet wet with CCAN, I'm starting to be able to contribute a little bit more meaningfully. But these are just some of the ideas that I'd actually like to see CCAN develop along. So, and this is kind of the, just my perspective on things. Ooh. Um, maybe hold off on questions because that a lot of that stuff is the sort of stuff we can go into the workshop. So yeah. unless you've got a particular one, looks like you. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, a quick one on spatial adjustment. Yeah. Is that going to be in place? Spatial adjustment is working. What's that? Is but that is that going to be in place? It's running the spatial adjustment. In terms of what yes. we're working with, yeah. Because we don't, we're not running GeoServer on anything else. So. Because I mean that's. Something that we use as our value add yeah. as such. You just throw a spatial file and we'll turn it into a web service for you. And a lot of the other portals or anything else aren't doing that. So it's an ideal candidate as a, for a microservice. Yeah. 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 Where any other portal might drop a zip file in, it might store it locally, but then you would go through a round trip and then magically other resources appear on it. That's it. So where has it? Where's the data, the original data source stored? On data gathering. For? Okay. So when you upload a shape file to data gathering. Yeah, so, so it 
it sits on the local uh, file system, the shape file, but what happens is there's a Python script that runs in the background that runs a program um, um, over, over you know what that is. And what it does is it ingests that into a PostGIS database. So it gets turned into um, WKB, into that PostGIS database. And then on top of that, we have GeoServer running on another server and we send some API calls to it to connect with that yeah. particular set of records. Yeah. And that GeoServer has a canonical endpoint. Yeah. So now, that's saying you run the data portal. Um, it, it's at the moment just a government data portal. And the idea there is that the point of source remains that whatever government department and don't store the data for them. So, but in the future, they're looking to get citizen science data in there and things like that. And that would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's in talking to people, it's really useful in that. I know I want to do spatial, but I don't want to fire up an ArcGIS server, or I don't want to set up a geo server. I can create these files for all kind of people. And we've got that middle run to be able to say, we can turn these into web services for you. Well, we don't want to get up too much of Sam's time, so you're up. Yeah.